Well, God dang, Green, that, that's uh, terrific. It really is. And uh, finally, uh, our final uh, our final lecture. And uh, there's no one that can do this better than Andrew, uh, Professor Bolton. He's uh, the grand master at uh, starting and finishing. Uh, and uh, he has the stage again uh, with the title of his talk to put all of these things together that you've been listening to. Uh, and uh, he's been sitting up in front diligently taking notes like the teacher's pet that he once was. He's quite a gunner as a young man. Uh, and that is a cogito ergo summary. I uh, like that. Uh, take home message from a Cartesian projection. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome for the final DEF CON 15 talk. Uh, Professor Andrew Bolton. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's glad to see a few people are still here. Uh, you're probably feeling like this audience here. Um, and, you know, I just hope you can manage to stay awake for the next 25 minutes or so as I try and summarize some of the uh, features here. And I hope also that I'm a slightly better speaker than the speaker on this picture. You can judge for that. So I have some disclosures, and that is that all slides have been stolen, uh, mainly from other speakers, including myself. I will not this year be able to cover any of the videos because it's simply not possible to get them on one presentation. So I'll be focusing on the talks. And we started, as we did last year, with rather depressing news from Europe in terms of what's going on in Eastern Europe, especially Ukraine. Uh, and, of course, we blame the politicians, so perhaps this billboard is of interest, and that says that diapers and politicians should be changed often, both for the same reason, which is probably a good thing. But we, more seriously, have a war, of course, against diabetes, and a lot of this cost, as we've just heard, uh, sort of rather false cost reductions, that the state of Arizona made, they saved a hell of a lot of money, $351,000, but it cost them $16.7 million to do that, which is curious economics. So we started uh, after my talk with detente. Are we seeing a Cuban-American digital alliance by Jorge Berlanga Acosta, who is uh, not of his first visit to here? And he talked about the diabetes environment and the chronicity of diabetic foot wounds. And then he talked to us about epigenetic forces disrupting vascular morphogenesis. And, of course, he mentioned some of the therapies that they're injecting uh, in the form of Hebropod in, in Cuba and elsewhere. And he talked about the rationale for infiltration of wounds uh, and, uh, of course, presented a lot of their data. Then we moved on, if the slide will move on, uh, to a view to the future, perhaps uh, Cuba and America for after so many 50, 60 years might actually become more friendly than they have been in recent years and one can only hope that the answer is yes because Cuba is a wonderful country. Then we heard the first talk from Grant and, and he talked about a diabetic emergency that's 2 million feet long. Uh, I didn't capture his slides from the last presentation because I finished this talk at lunchtime and they weren't there so, but uh, you've just heard. Uh, false economics, if you like, uh, and how saving money can actually uh, be false. It actually led to more spending. He, he emphasized in his Thursday talk the huge amount of the economic burden of diabetic foot ulcers in the inpatient setting. And you can see the national inpatient bill uh, in the bottom right there. And he talked about but ED in, in diabetes is erectile dysfunction. I, I got a bit of a fright when I saw this. Uh, diabetic foot ulcers in erectile dysfunction settings. But, of course, he means the emergency room. I thought that was the ER in America. We call it the A&E, accident and emergency. But ED is a new one. But look at the cost. And he's absolutely right. There are so many diabetic foot problems coming to the emergency room that get mishandled and mistreated, ending up in disaster. So... His conclusion from both uh, inpatient and emergency department setting was that there hasn't been a reduction. The numbers have reigned relatively constant over the time as a percentage of uh, the diabetes admissions. And a lot of uh, severe outcomes. And the costs are, of course, horrific. And there is an ethnic disparity. Then we heard our friend uh, Nicholas Schaper from Maastricht who talked to us about the Eurodial, uh, which we've heard about before. And he also concluded uh, from a, a large database from a lot of clinics in 14 centers in 10 countries that two-thirds of all diabetic foot ulcers can heal without amputation. 
But peripheral arterial disease is increasingly found in diabetic foot ulcers that 20, 30 years ago were predominantly neuropathic. And the double whammy of infection plus arterial disease, of course, is an increased risk for amputation. And he's absolutely right. Many of us talk, but do we say, but also do what we say? And uh, I think that's something to reflect on. Then we moved south in Europe to uh, the beautiful city of Pisa and Alberto Piagesi, a country of 60 million inhabitants with 4 million people with diabetes and many diabetic foot problems. And he concluded, and he's set a very good example in Pisa with the multidisciplinary diabetic foot care team, but also uh, with the courses they run there. Uh, and it's a complex issue that involves not only education, but organizational aspects as well and technical aspects. Uh, and he went on to emphasize the need for an integrated approach and organization and implementation of consensus guidelines. And then in the last one, if I remember in that session, was the bad, the ugly, and the goodney. Uh, but that's an Armstrongism, I think, for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Or at least I hope it is. Uh, and Philip Goodney talked to us about the trends in amputation in, in the United States. And you can see there has been a decrease there. And many regions are doing better. And you can see uh, the red are those that have had a reduced amputation rate. Of course, we should be also looking to the small amount of green on the right where there's actually been an increase. But despite this, and he talked to us about the interaction between intensity of, of vascular care and amputation, there was a very good correlation, you see. But if you look at costs, there wasn't a correlation. In other words, the more you spend doesn't mean the better it is. More expensive is not necessarily better. And despite a fall in all ethnic groups, there is still a marked ethnic disparity in this country uh, for amputations in people with diabetes. And the conceptual model, a low-cost, high-yield approach, limiting amputations even in the most difficult populations. Then we moved to uh, Nina Petrova, who gave a very nice talk from King's College in London, and she uh, showed in many slides that the great dis disparity and the variability of foot problems seen in the King's Clinic, which has been set up for more than 25 years. And she presented data on their very recent study showing that casting is safe. People say, I don't want to do total contact cast because you can injure the insensitive limb, which is true, of course, hence the reason to remove a cast after a week, after two weeks, and so on. But total contact cast treatment they showed in this paper just published uh, is safe with only 5% 5 5 or so minor cast-related problems. And she presented some good news. The diabetic foot has defeated every healthcare system in the world, but advances in understanding have led to improvement in care as they've been able to show. And then we had the, the It Takes Two to Tango sort of presentation from Shanghai and Tucson. I've been to both places. They're quite dissimilar, I have to say. Uh, but it was nice to, to see these two individuals presenting uh, on the, the collaboration. But the most frightening thing here is the high prevalence of diabetes in China. Uh, from 0.7% in 1979 to 9.3% in 2013, but there was actually a paper, a population-based study in the New England Journal recently from China showing 10%. That means already there are 120 million people with diabetes, or 130 million as a population is 1.3 billion. And he estimated it will be 143 million by 2035. We're nearly there now. And then we went uh, east to uh, Moscow, and a typically Armstrongian, uh, Armstrong sort of esque title from Russia with pus forming a bond without a money penny. Uh, and we heard this interesting talk and interesting uh, statistics from there. And they've been able to reduce foot ulcer rates in many patients. And the federal law in, in Russia from 95 on social defense of people with diabetes. They're providing shoes and insoles, which is having an impact. And then uh, we heard from Andy Mayer, who works uh, at Temple. I thought it was Temple, Texas, but of course it's Temple University in Philadelphia in the Northeast. Uh, uh, and he has been able to look at the underserved, underinsured popula uh, population there in Philadelphia. Again, a multidisciplinary approach leading to better outcome. An intervention isn't really a success unless it is sustainable. That's a message that's come throughout this meeting. 
And lastly, in that session, we heard from Carol Bakker, immediate uh, past chair of the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot, and he talked about the guidelines and, of course, that will be renewed, some of them, uh, in uh, a couple of months' time. Then we had a very nice session on vascular disease, started by Darren Schneider, who just chaired the last session. And of course, emphasizing that critical limb ischemia is a huge risk not only for amputation but for mortality. And they should go under, undergo expedited multidisciplinary evaluation with the goal of limb salvage. And there was a discussion throughout this session of the balance. Are we favoring endovascular uh, out, uh, interventions or surgical ones? And we heard from many of the speakers in that session, of course, favoring bypass, uh, longevity, lower risk, younger patient perhaps with good conduit and extensive tissue loss, whereas a high risk patient uh, with less likely to live that long with simpler lesions with limited tissue loss perhaps might do better with endovascular. Charting the correct course, we've heard about the need for prompt evaluation of critical limb ischemia. It's not necessarily endo or surgery first, it should be patient first, and this came uh, in each of the talks, I think, especially from Spence Taylor at the end. Both are complementary approaches and essential components of comprehensive revascularization program, and endovascular therapies will continue to evolve because there is a huge upmet lead. Then we came to the conference course director, Joe Mills, and I liked his three, three spheres, limb status, talking about the Wi-Fi system, patient status, and anatomy. And, of course, has been validated now by the Society of Vascular Surgery, the Wi-Fi index, wound ischemia, and foot infection. Concluding that wound in depth ischemia and foot infection are the critical factors that need to be considered and grading, like a TNM system for cancers, and the simple risk comorbidity index, an updated practical arterial anatomic classification system will be of added value and may follow. Then it was a, a pleasure to hear Frank the Gerfo again. I've known Frank for probably nearly 30 years and it's a pleasure to see him here. And he talked about, in, in vascular surgery, the compromised biology in the foot. If ischemia is present in the consent of a diabetic foot ulcer, it warrants correction. And that's a, a message that kept pervading, was, was very prevalent in this session. Ischemia is the only component of foot biology that can actually be corrected. And we discussed when to bypass, and so, for example, status post-debridement, deep or non-healing ulcer plus absent pulses, arteriography, of course, and then bypass if possible. And interesting that, that we heard uh, that vascular surgeons now perform the most, uh, as you see here in the red, uh, of these uh, percutaneous vascular procedures. Uh, and we then heard about the best CLI, the best trials that are coming up. The best CLI is the endovascular versus uh, surgical therapy. And this is a study that has started enrollment and will report probably, perhaps we will hear the results at the next DFCON in a couple of years. And a similar trial going on in the United Kingdom from Andrew Bradbury and colleagues, he's based in Birmingham, the Basel II uh, study surgical bypass versus uh, angioplasty stenting in severe ischemia. So these are important trials that we must look for the results of. And then perhaps an appropriately named person, Dr. Sugar, for a meeting on diabetes, gave this remarkable talk on robots, basically. He talked about the overview of wearable robots, what technology we have, what the challenges are, the robotic tendon, uh, and he, I can't possibly show his video, it would be too big to fit on my stick, but uh, we had some remarkable videos of the possibilities of the future, uh, as you see here, microprocessor knees, powered ankles, and so on. And we learned a lot that springs are the key, the kinematics and kinetics to use springs that are tuned to the body's uh, movement. And his vision it was a mechanical system and control algorithms working together. Robots follow the user and no simulated compliance and not restricted only to joint control. A fascinating talk followed by an equally fascinating talk from a cardiologist, uh, Marv Slepian, again from Tucson, talking about epidermal electronics coming to a tattoo, I think misspelt there by the way, uh, near you. 
And he concluded that these new material constructs, stretchable, transient, pizza, electronic materials, can address needs and can be like, indeed like a tattoo. And then we heard again from Joe Mills the pros and cons of perfusion assessment. Why bother? And I, I like this uh, look. The basic clinical approach is still essential. Look at the feet. Clearly a high-risk neuropathic foot looking there. But then look at the total feet. Not only look, but listen. And I keep telling my junior doctors that more important than the ankle brachial index, which is falsely elevated, is to listen to the Doppler waveform. Listen with a simple handheld Doppler. And then also, of course, feel. Feel the pulses. A basic clinical approach. There's no technology that can beat that. A simplified approach, careful pulse and Doppler evaluation. And then, of course, go on to objectively measure perfusion with the multiple tests that we have available to us. And then we heard the first of two talks from Spence Taylor, uh, and it was uh, the most practical and logical approach. And look at this case he presented. Here's Mrs. C, a 70-year-old white female, I guess is WF, transferred from an outlying hospital with left leg ischemic ulcers, blistered, and there's what he found. So what he did, did all the surgery. She went home with a leg intact, but post-operative discharge, I think that's what it means, post anyway, 50 days later she died. Now that would be classed as a success. But is it really a successful outcome? And that's the key question. And he presented, as he just did in the last talk, many uh, of his uh, very large observational studies on determinants of functional outcome. Uh, and looking at you know, how outcomes really are, are quite good. Functional outcome, though, is not solely determined by limb salvage or reconstruction patency, but by functional, mental, and medical condition, the total position of the patient, not simply that that patient went home, as far as you're concerned, a successful outcome, even if they only live for two months. So lessons have been learned and need to be continued to be learned. The patient-centered expectations and outcomes after critical limb ischemia are unique and are distinctly different from what is being measured. I would take from the doctor's dilemma wrote by George Bernard Shaw. He said, sometimes we have to throw the towel in. He's absolutely right. George Bernard Shaw wrote these words when he was elderly. Don't try and live forever because you will not succeed. And we need to remember that. And this is, I love this slide. The cold hard truth of Spence. Human life is a sexually transmitted disease with 100% mortality. And he's absolutely right. And then we moved on to the question of Charcot and William Jeffcoat's uh, first talk on Charcot expressionism. And he charted us through the very complex potential causative factors, the inflammatory factors, and what we've learned in recent years, and they still have a lot to learn about the Charcot foot. The active Charcot, we should say, rather than acute, is an expression of a process occurring in people with many overlapping problems which are mediated by abnormal responses to injury and inflammation. It's a syndrome, not a disease. We've learned a lot, but we have a lot more to learn. And then we had an excellent talk again from Nina Petrova, the riddle inside an enigma wrapped in edema. Spelt the American way, it had to be, of course. And she talked about the need for Charcot medicine. There may be no symptoms and signs. You can't have a symptom-driven condition. Maybe no investigation is abnormal. The diagnosis is difficult. What treatment do we have? And so on. And she presented some interesting data on osteoclasts, again, uh, in response to MCSF and RANCAL treatment, and, and many interesting results she showed about TNS-alpha, IL-6, IL-1-beta, and then brought in perhaps Cathepsin, the new player in the uh, Charcot pathogenesis. Perhaps Upregulation can solve the riddle inside the enigma of bone destruction wrapped in edema, she concluded. Then we moved on to the bus. Of course, this Seco bus, who is now on his way to see the tennis final at Indian Wells, he told me just now. And he's uh, offloading the bus. Uh, that was a good title, David. Well done. Yeah. Um, we talked. I mentioned Paul Brand earlier at the lunchtime symposia. There he is, bottom right. And nothing is new in medicine. It's rediscovered. Uh, and when we're talking about pressure... 
Of course, it's the critical quantity that determines the harm done by the force, as Brown pointed out, in these pressure transducers from many years ago. Today, we have much uh, more distinctly reliable measures of pressure, and you see here, I think, an EMED of various feet showing the peaks and troughs. And he went on about the total contact cast and how this can isolate the wound and redistribute, not, re not remove, but redistribute pressures, as he's shown in, in cast examples here. Then he talked about the two studies. Of course, Jan Olbrecht talked about the second one from Diabedia. He talked about his diabetic foot orthopedic shoe trial uh, and how adherence was not that great. And interestingly, if you look at ulcer recurrence, overall, there was no significant difference between the intervention, custom-made shoe group, and the standard. But then if you took into account those patients who had adhered to the offloading, to wearing the shoe, then, of course, you saw the statistical difference. So the take-home message is not everyday low pressure, but it's also every day we need high adherence. Then we had, the, as always, the very enthusiastic talk from Bijan, uh, and he talked about the association between dosing of physical activity and wound healing outcomes. Activities may delay wound healing. Perhaps they may enhance wound healing. We'll see. And he then went on to show, I'm trying to move faster here, uh, outcomes, a change in wound size in a, a, a study which randomized people to instant total contact cast. They couldn't remove a removable cast walker. Look at the poor control. I was horrified. 10%, my goodness. A higher proportion of patients healed at 12 weeks in the instant total contact cast, adherence to offloading. But also it appears that those who stand for longer periods of time uh, don't have such a good outcome. So increase in activity may be due to less usage of offloading. And he talked then about the importance of not standing for long periods of time. Uh, and then we went to the second talk by Alberto BJC, who looked at the various offloading techniques, of which some of them he's, of course, done in Pisa. And he concluded that offloading is indeed the etiological therapy for neuropathic foot ulcers and acute Charcot neuroarthropathy. Uh, a total contact cast is the primary, perhaps only in Charcot, and we have other more modern casting techniques for patients with foot wounds. Non-removability should be challenged with biomechanically adequate comparators and perhaps we should reserve the non-removable cast to those people who are clearly not adhering to the cast therapy in the first instance. And lastly in that session we had a very nice presentation of the work uh, from Jan Olbrecht and Peter Kavanagh uh, uh, and this is the careful prevention trial where they randomized patients to in-shoe orthoses and individually custom design based upon barefoot plantar pressure. This study was published just last year in Diabetes Care and it was conducted in a large number of clinics across the U.S. Three experimental, uh, three, uh, sorry, experimental, and then there were three control groups, three different uh, orthoses, control orthoses, on a 3-1-1-1 randomization. Uh, and the study gave quite excellent results and that showed that the specially designed orthoses did uh, reduce the risk of recurrent ulceration. Highly significant. So patient-specific orthoses designed on the basis of foot shape and base barefoot plantar pressures uh, can be produced and are superior. A very important message. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to move on a little faster. Then we came to uh, Chris Attinger. You know it's Chris Attinger if you see a lion or a tiger or a cheetah or some animal from Africa. And he talked about negative pressure wound therapy with instill and appears to be more effective than the NPH, negative pressure wound therapy alone in preparing the surgical wound for closure, was his. And then we moved on to gentle Ben Lipsky. Now, I was at junior high school in Long Island in the 1960s, but I must admit I can't remember watching this TV program or reading this uh, rag or comic but Gentle Ben apparently was a bear. I'm not sure looking here he was quite so gentle, but uh, he's about to devour this person on the right. Uh, but Ben talked to us about the barest steps to appropriate therapy, and he emphasized, as he always does, send optimal specimens, tissue, not the swab. For culture, use narrow spectrum antibiotics once you've got the uh, sensitivities. MRSA is similar to MSSA in presentation and outcome. MRSA is probably usually a contaminant. 
give antibiotics for as short as duration as possible, maximize non-antibiotic approaches, and do not treat with antibiotics clinically non-infected wounds. So that was the bare facts on infection from gentle bear, Ben Bear, if we like. Then we had William again with the Neverland Valley, the diagnosis and misdiagnosis of osteomyelitis. And he left us with a lot of questions. You can suspect osteomyelitis if you have these findings. But is it osteomyelitis or Charcot? The x-ray may be difficult to determine between the both. The probe to bone depends upon the population you're looking at. It's better for excluding rather than diagnosing osteomyelitis. Blood tests, not that useful. Imaging. And he went on. And we have a lot more work to do in this area. It is difficult to evaluate the tests that we use if we do not have agreed definitions. Surely that is true. Then he went on to talk about Warren Joseph now, MRSA, MRSA. What's new to treat it? And he talked to us about this new uh, topical peptide antibiotic, Pexigannon, at the end of his talk. And this is now in phase three trials and is looking promising. And he concluded that MRSA rates seem to be decreasing. Even if MRSA is found, it may not make a difference in outcome, hence it's maybe opportunistic colonization. There are now nine FDA-approved MRSA antibiotics. Most of them very expensive, I hasten to add. More work is needed in this area, and the pipeline may contain unique agents such as Paxiganon. And then we had a fascinating talk at the end of the afternoon by Dr. Cutter on the bacteriophage. And it was interesting to hear that she was first introduced to this in 1996, if I remember, in Tbilisi, Georgia, where I was just a month ago. And it's a much different city, I can assure her, than it was 20 years ago, because I was there then, and it was pretty grim. And she talked about this new way, and this marvellous superbugs threatened to return us to the Dark Ages. I can remember that in the Times. Interest is growing in phages. Uh, and as she said, as we explore the possibilities of using phage to help postpone and combat the crisis of antibiotic resistance, it is worth thinking about that challenge. An area to watch. And then we come to the, this last session, and we heard Spence again, and I like that, Amputations Anonymous. My name is Spence and I amputate legs. I'm sure he, he does amputate legs, as all the vascular surgeon does here, but I know really that he tries not to. But he's absolutely right. There is a role in some patients, and he showed us data, very clear data, that some people do better with amputation as the first, rather than, I think he showed, versus angioplasty in, in some difficult cases. So amputation does have a therapeutic role, and many patients, the younger one, who are not terribly obese, mobilize well and have better quality of life. In the absence of predictors for bad outcomes, success after BKA is obtainable in nearly 70% of patients. In the presence of a chronic non-healing foot sore, amputation may improve survival. So I will leave you with these words, and I hope it doesn't apply to you. Before I came to your lecture, I was confused Having heard it, I am still confused, but at least on a higher level. But I will end with a couple of quotes from Paul Brand, who we've heard, we've talked about today. When he retired, he said at his retirement speech that after retirement, he thinks he might become a shoemaker because more diabetic patients had congratulated him on the shoes that he had prescribed rather than on the foot surgery he has performed. But he was a model I think we should all follow. Uh, and I will leave you the, with this thought, with what he said again at his retirement. Because of where I practice medicine, I never made much money. But I look back over a lifetime of surgery. The host of friends who were once my patients bring me more joy than wealth can ever bring. And I think that's a nice note to end on. Patients first. Thank you very much.